Hey everybody, what's up? It's David Aryev here yet again for iDesign.com, and you know when I come around, it's Octane time. So today we're going to be developing a pretty intense Mars environment using sand and rock displacement textures, as well as displacement deformers, and a bunch of color matching lighting and compositional techniques. Then next week we're going to be using Kitbash 3D's excellent space colony buildings to add an even higher level of quality to our final renders. It's going to be a long one, but I hope you join me the whole way through because it's packed to the gills with content. Let's get in there and make something cool. All right, so first off, I've got something pretty cool for you guys. Kitbash 3D and I have teamed up to get you a 15% off promo code. So just go to kitbash3d.com, and then when you add something to the cart, for instance, this Future Slums kit, go to checkout, and then enter the discount code REVBASH. And that'll get you 15% off your order. So hopefully this will be especially helpful in part two where we're using these kitbash packs a lot. All right, first let's run through some of these renders that I created using the kitbash 3D space colony. First, I started out with this moon environment and I liked the lighting that I developed. I liked the crater and the different levels of depth in this image where I had a foreground, a midground with a crater, and then a background with this asteroid belt and some nebula action going on. But the buildings felt really weird. Like they felt kind of like miniatures and I couldn't put my finger on it at first, but the way they're grouped was really hurting the scale in this scene. And at some point I realized that when humans build cities, even if they're small space colonies, they're not gonna spread things out evenly like this. They're going to create clusters because we naturally build cities where there are hubs and then there are accessory buildings surrounding them and also building on slopes even though I kind of wrote it off as oh there's less gravity here uh, that's just not something we're accustomed to seeing and it looks just messy in this context so you can see in this next still I took out these buildings on the slope and I focused a lot more on creating clusters of buildings and to me this feels a lot more logically laid out like we've got these bigger buildings that are the hubs and then we've got smaller buildings surrounding them kind of here and then this smaller building surrounding it and then out towards the perimeter we have things like these solar panels that are lower laying and we could equate this to farming and industry like maybe this is where a lot of the work is happening to keep the colony running whereas here maybe we've got the major scientific centers that's all kind of BS but you get the point that this looks a bit more convincing. I also felt the craters here made the buildings feel a lot more miniaturized, so I brought the displacement down, and this felt a little better, but I still wasn't totally happy, so I ended up using an entirely different texture that I feel like helped sell the scale a bit better. Though I'm still not totally happy with the scale, and I feel if I had gone a bit further and added in little lights and maybe people or moon rovers and things like that, that I would have sold the scale a bit better. Here are some other angles. You can see here that I've got a totally different displacement on this foreground than this background. And I liked that this texture kind of brought out the buildings a bit more, and this one really enhanced the craters in the background. Like here with this texture, because we don't have the craters, we don't see the buildings getting so buried. But in the background, we can see these craters, and that creates a bit more of an epic moon surface kind of vibe. Now, I wasn't totally happy with this whole setup, and I wanted to try something a bit different with this kit bash, and maybe see what it would look like if I tried to build out a Mars environment. So this was my first still here, and I think this is a lot more successful at communicating the scale because we're down in the buildings, we see things like this door here and this vehicle, so we know how big a human would be, and we've also got some atmosphere or Martian dust or whatever you want to call it that's causing this fall off in depth and making us feel like we're seeing a great distance. And here's the final still of this Martian environment that I made, where I feel it's interesting seeing this foreground rover, as well as the city in the background, with some volumetric light in here, as well as the sand texture with a bunch of rocks poking through, to break that pattern up and give the surface some variation. Alright, so we're going to work on building the Mars scene, because ultimately I feel like the look I developed was a little more sophisticated than the moon one, but if you guys really want to know how I built that space scene, then leave me a note in the comments. And if enough people are really itching for that tutorial, then I'll make it happen. All right, first I want to highlight this program called PureRef, which is actually a free download. Uh, just go to pureref.com. And it's super useful because when you drag in images, it maintains the source resolution. So you can come to any of these and look full res and also zoom out to get an overall idea of what you're going for. And the other mode I have it set to is if you right click and go to mode, you can go to always on bottom. So when I'm working, say I have a window pulled up, uh, I can work and then just minimize to see this in the background at any time, almost like a desktop background. So this helps me get an idea of the color palette that I want and gives me some kind of inspirational imagery. Like I'm never going to get something as 
awesome as what's in the Martian, but I'm going to try to get like, I don't know, 50% of the way there. Like this is really cool here, seeing these ripples of sand everywhere, but then broken up by all these little rocks and things. This is real Mars right here. These three are real Mars. So there are some really interesting cliff formations. And I'm pretty sure that this is real as well. Uh, it's like a stitched panorama and it's kind of amazing what Mars atmosphere does like this blue here is very cool and alien and something that I want to reflect in my render This is my favorite still here even though it's from a movie and is probably CG But I love the variation in the ripples of sand and then areas where the sand is collected And we've got these different formations as well as mountains that are off in the distance that have been buried by the atmosphere it can be really frustrating looking at some of these stills because there's tons of detail in, and terracing in these mountains. Uh, and then there are these subtle details like where the sand has buried the rocks and it's clear that it's like kind of eroded and blown over the rocks and stuff like that is really hard to create in CG. Um, but we'll see what we can do. But again, we're just creating something quick and we'll get as close as we can to things like these, but just try and let it be a source of inspiration rather than like crushing your soul and making you want to give up. I struggle with this personally all the time. Okay, so first we're going to start with creating the Mars environment and later we'll move on to adding the Kitbash 3D buildings in. So let's take a look at some sites that have some really useful assets that you could use uh, to create environments like this. But also keep in mind that I'm going to show some techniques in C4D if you're on a budget where you can create rock formations without having to go out and buy things. Okay, so first off, this is pretty obvious, but polygon.com. Uh, I feel like I've mentioned this a bunch of times before, but this is my favorite site for gathering textures. Um, and here I've gone for this ground sand rippled. I just searched for sand and then you get all these different sands, but this one has a nice displacement map and I like the look of it. Next, we've got realdisplacementtextures.com and under the shop, there's a section for packs and we've got this stones pack, which is really useful for scattering rocks on surfaces. There's also this quarry pack here. And this one has one of my favorite grounds that we'll definitely be using. Um, it's rock ground 06, though rock 08 looks pretty good too. But here's rock ground 06. And then Quixel Megascans, this is another great site. I picked up this rock sandstone as well as some of these cliff faces to play around with. And they've got some really cool detailed like volcanic rocks and other extremely detailed 3D scans that you can poke up through the sand and stone and create some bigger features off in the distance. Next is textures.com and they've actually been adding some really interesting 3D scans to their site as well. Um, like this layered cliff is super detailed and cool. And so are some other things like this rock base one here. This could be your ground or another cliff face. And interestingly, they've actually got the biggest collection of different sand formations. So I would definitely check these guys out and play with some of these assets here. Now, finally, I want to give a shout out to Blender Gurus, The Rock Essentials. Um, this is definitely the most expensive solution, but you can see there's some amazing stuff in this pack. Uh, you get a ton of different rocks to choose from. And there are even these extremely cool large rock formations, which can really help when you're trying to get something detailed from a distance that doesn't look repetitious. All right, so let's just start with building out the ground. Uh, I'll drop in a plane and I'll scale it up quite a bit. And this is just kind of arbitrary. I'm pretty terrible at working to scale, but if I make it bigger, then I can comfort myself that this is a big scene. Now first I'm going to play with creating big shapes uh, and then on top of the big shapes we'll add our micro details. So really we just want kind of smooth hills and maybe some slight mountainous terrain but nothing too detailed or else when we add displacement on top of it uh, things will get pinched and weird. So let's just start by adding a displacer to our plane here. So we'll come down here, hold down shift as we add the displacer so it drops right in there. And um, next we want our plane to have a lot more segments and I'll start out with 555 by 555 and you can see how much geometry that's added so that when we add a noise to this displacer, we'll get a much smoother result. So if we come over to shading, we'll just add in a default C40 noise. You can see that's way too small. It's just creating this crinkly texture. So let's jump in here and add some ones to our scale, uh, maybe even bigger like that. And then we'll come back up here and go to our object and just increase the height. So now we're getting some 
generic looking hills. And then I'm going to hit N A so that we can go back to the shaded view here. Okay, so now we can create some additional displacement looks. If we jump over here, we can add this into a layer shader. And this way we can add additional displacements that will then blend back with the original noise. So we can just right click and copy shader and then right click and paste shader and we'll have another noise. Then we can jump in here and we've got all sorts of stuff to play with. So let's try Luca. And obviously this is too spiky, so let's just increase the scale. And now we've got something a little more interesting, though it's looking too geometric. So let's increase the octaves. And now we've got something that's more organic looking, but this is too high frequency for what we're going for. We want this to be handled by an additional displacement map on top. Remember, we're just going for those big shapes and then we'll create the small shapes afterwards. So let's try something like maybe Hama. And if we bring down this high clip, we can kind of see what's going on. Though, again, I think these are a bit too computer generated looking. Um, they could work though, I think with all of that additional displacement, there's no way you would ever notice these straight lines, but I still want to try something a bit different. So let's go for stuple. And we're going to have to take the high clip back up here. And let's take our scale back down to something like whatever this is, 41,000. Like this is maybe getting general enough that it'll work, but another thing we can do is bring back down the octaves. So here, we're losing detail, but that's actually a good thing. We just want the general shapes. So let's see how far we can push this before it looks a little too uh, geometric. Like this is too much. So let's go to maybe, let's just try five. I think this is good. So like if you're down here, even though there's some detail, you can imagine that each of these is a little hill and there's still plenty of room to add tons of additional detail. Okay, so let's do this again. We'll just go copy shader and paste shader and let's try one more noise type Naki's kind of interesting though earlier I was having good results with Ober this creates some cool breakup on the surface and these kind of look like ravines and you can always change the seed if you want to see something different Let's just try this for now. Okay, so now we can play around with blending these back. You can literally just take down the opacity here and blend them together. Or you can use an actual blend mode if you want the effect to get more extreme. So overlay, we could overlay all three of these together and get something totally weird and unique. Or we could screen them on top. I'm liking the way that's looking. And this original noise isn't actually doing anything right now. So if we drag it on top, we could set this to overlay mode. And this would actually increase the contrast of our terrain. So those bumps are kind of getting added into the mix. Whereas if we just had this at normal mode and we dialed back the opacity, this would kind of flatten everything out and water it down versus overlay, which is a mode that's designed to increase the contrast, uh, basically brighter brights and darker darks, if that makes sense from your After Effects knowledge. That seems to be working pretty well. We could also enhance this by jumping into this noise and playing with the low and high clip to exaggerate it even more. Though I don't think that's necessary. I think I was happy like right about here. Now let's just store this displacer away for a second and try one more thing. So let's turn off these other two noise patterns and set this one to normal. And let's make this even bigger. So let's just set this to two. And now so we can really see what's going on, let's just boost the contrast until we've got something like this. So a noise pattern like this that's super large and kind of general can really break up the terrain into these large patches. So when I increase the contrast, there are areas that are white that are causing it to displace upwards like this and areas that are black that are causing it to displace downwards. And we can use this to our advantage if we jump back up here. Um, say we want to essentially mix, this is almost like an octane mix node, where we're saying this noise will mix between these other two and designate the different regions of the other two noises. And to make this really obvious what I'm doing, I'm just going to create a new noise shader that's really small scale. Um, and this one is going to be set to, this one that we just created is going to be set to layer mask. And this will function just like in After Effects where it's referencing the layer above it. So if I turn this on, you can see 
this is driving the regions of what noises appear where. If I crank this contrast up to 100%, you can really see these patches. But if we actually pull back on the contrast, then we'll start to blend these together in a much more smooth way, where here we've got one patch and here we've got another. So really, I just wanted to show you that you can use this to drive different regions and create more variation in the displacements that you're making. Here, we don't want this really high frequency noise. We just want to mix between these two, where one is Ober and the other one is Stupel. I'm going to jump back to our first example because I found this a little bit more detailed and interesting. But I definitely encourage you to jump in and play with this layer mask thing because you can create all sorts of interesting combinations of noises using this technique. Another thing we can do is just extend our plane out so we're not cutting off this ravine here. And maybe give ourselves a bit more room to play. At this point, I'm going to Option G, group this in a null, and call it old. And I'm going to duplicate this out here, turn this off, and right-click and go Current State to Object so that we've got a baked down plane. Uh, because I'm just going to commit to this and use this as the base for my ground and low-lying landscape. We'll add mountains and jagged rocks and stuff like that later. The other cool thing about making this editable is now, say we had a composition that we liked, up here, for instance, and we wanted to bring in some more foreground elements, we could just hit MC to bring up the brush and start moving around our terrain. So if I set this mode to normal, we'll just be affecting the polygons in their normal direction. So either towards the normal direction, or if you hold down control, away from the normal direction. And this way we could just increase our brush radius by holding down middle click and kind of popping out some terrain and giving ourselves somewhere to rest the camera to maybe create some interesting foreground, like we're looking down a hill into this terrain. And we can also go to the smoothing mode here and start to even out our terrain a little bit if it's getting too pinched. Okay, next I'm just gonna add in a few landscape objects to block in some mountains so that when we're lighting and texturing, uh, we have an idea of the perspective and the depth haze and stuff like that. It's just good to have these elements in there for compositional reference that we can go back and then replace with more detailed mountains later. So here I'll just scale this way up and we can increase the width and depth segments. But we don't need a ton of detail because this stuff's going to be in the pretty far background. We might have one poking out of the landscape a bit closer. Um, so let's bring this up so we can play with the scale, uh, we can play with the height here. But that's a little extreme, let's take down the scale. And there's also rough furrows and fine furrows. I don't think we need, we can have it be a bit smoother. We can also art direct this from the camera's perspective and maybe stretch this range out. It's also good if you hit Shift V to up the opacity on your tinted border so you can really see what your end composition is going to be. So maybe that's cool and then we have some further in the background and we can always go in and change the seed. and just hold down control to duplicate. And we can always scale these up as well. So we're creating something that looks like a mess from this perspective, but when we're down in these, it doesn't really matter because we're never gonna see that it's not joined to the rest of the terrain. Now at some point it clips off so for that, we want to hit Control D so we can continue seeing what we're doing. And we'll just turn this view clipping to large or huge would also work. And to me, it feels a little more interesting if we have kind of an open space, like a path to lead the eye through this image. 
before this middle mountain was just kind of blocking the whole composition. So let's change the seed again. Let's move this back further. And just try to give it a layered depth and sense that we're looking at a very large scale scene. All right, so next we want to start to texture this landscape. So I'm going to go for a rock texture as the base. So I'm going to open up that real displacement texture, uh, rock ground 06 that I showed you guys earlier. And remember that you can use any kind of photo scan ground texture here. And one really nice thing is that they have C4D and Octane project files so that when you load these up, all the textures are already linked up in the node editor. So if you come over here, you can take a look and let's just give ourselves some room to look at this real quick. You can see they've already piped in the displacement, the normal in the normal map. We've got a bump map. And here, this is kind of interesting. They've got a roughness map as well as gloss maps that go into the specular. But there are two different gloss maps, one that's normal and one that's a high gloss. And the high gloss is just more crunched down than the regular gloss. And they're mixed together with a mixed texture node at 50%. So nothing too crazy going on here, just a big time saver. So let's take this and copy it into our other project file. Bring this back over. And then let's just drop it onto this plane, which I'll name ground. All right, let's send this off to the live viewer. OK, so a couple things. Um, obviously, we're not getting any textures yet. But see these black weird smudges here? This is a ray epsilon issue. So I'm going to jump in here and then just increase this a little bit. And that should go away. This is because our scene scale is a little bit too big, and if you ever see weird artifacts like that, just mess around with Ray Epsilon. Now the other thing that's going on is if we go to Window, Texture Manager, you can see that these are all unlinked because I just copied them over. So if you go Edit, Select Missing Textures, and then Edit, Relink Textures, this is actually just a search window, so whichever folder you choose, it'll search within that entire hierarchy for the textures that it's looking for. Mine are in this my mega assets library folder and then textures and I've got a folder for 3d scanned so I'll just hit okay and it goes through and links them all up at once which is awesome okay so at this point the texture is scaled up way too high and we could go into our node editor like we usually do and replace all of these bitmap materials with image texture nodes so that we could drive all of them with a transform Okay, but the easier way is to actually scale from Cinema 4D's dialog here because this controls the texture all at once. Whereas here we would have to set up a transform node that's linked into each one of these. But these two systems work together. You can scale from here or you can scale uh, an offset using this dialog here. So I'm just going to set it down to something like 20 to start. And sometimes it gets hung up where it only accepted one of those transforms. So let's just refresh. Okay, so there we go. But we're actually going to have to scale this down a lot further. So let's go all the way down to 2. Cool, so this is a pretty good base and what I'm looking for, if you just notice a jump in the color, it's because I had some Octane camera settings going on that I'll go over in a little bit. But for starters, um, I'm not liking the tearing that's going on with this displacement, so I think this needs to be cut down. Uh, so if I jump in here to the displacement, I can just set this to 25. And I think that works a little bit better. So now let's add in our daylight here. And let's rotate it until we can actually see the sun there we go okay so now I'm gonna jump into the camera imager settings and enable the camera imager then turn up highlight compression all the way I like this because it gives you a bit more dynamic range and now I can actually see the Sun a little bit better see there we go so I want to match this a little bit more closely to our reference images which if you look here and here something really interesting happens on Mars where the sun actually appears a little bit cyan and then it falls off to this dusty orangish brown. So let's see if we can recreate this with our daylight system. If I go into my daylight here and change the sky color to a bit of an orange, we get that. And then let's change the sun color to more of a cyan. And that's like too extreme, so let's take this down and boost up the value so that it's not gray. Okay, let's push this a little bit more towards brown. So this is getting a bit closer, but it's still kind of muddy. And at this point, I really like to add in a custom LUT in this field here. 
So one of my favorite LUT packs is called Osiris. Um, just Google Osiris LUTs. And in here, I like to use the Rec. 709 LUTs because those are meant to go on footage with a, a normal color profile versus like a log curve, which would be a lot flatter. So I like the KDX LUT here. And you can see that it's making things a bit more extreme. But what I want to do is change the underlying colors of the sun again. So if I go back here and change this more to an orange, and then desaturate the sun color and maybe take down the amount of orange here so it's a bit paler okay let's go to our camera imager and continue to play with this you can see what the LUT is doing here let's bring up the exposure maybe and then down on the gamma to add a bit more contrast and then let's go to the post processing tab and enable it and take the glare power all the way down and then up the bloom so we just get a bit of that haze coming in now, I feel like we've lost some of the orange vibe that we need. If we look back here at the reference images, there's definitely more, a little bit more orange going on in some of these. So let's boost this up a bit. I think it helps taking down the power and maybe saturate the sky a bit more. But then we get a bit too orange, so maybe we take it more saturation and less brightness. Let's keep going with that. Let's push this maybe a bit more red. So I'm liking the look of this sky gradient, but now we've lost all the detail down here. So if we go back to our camera imager, we can just up the gamma. And this is kind of a delicate balance, but I want to see some blue in the sun, but not in the rocks here. So I'm going to take this back a bit, maybe down to like 7% or even all the way down to 5 and now I feel like these highlights are no longer tinted in that kind of gross cyan color, but I'm still getting a bit of that cyan ring in the sky, which I like. Okay, and let's also take the bloom a little bit back down so that it's not kind of so overwhelming. And here, if I want to bring a bit more orange into these rocks, what I can do is I can just pull in a mixed texture here and then put this into the diffuse slot and replace this. And then bring in an RGB spectrum, which is just a color. So I'll pop that into texture one. So now it's blending 50% between this white color and the original texture. But here we can just set this to a pretty saturated yellow and then dial that in. So you can see as we bring this slider back a little bit, we're getting a lot more orange here, but it's also still too dark. So if we go to this color correction, we can just set the brightness to two and maybe this is a little bit too yellow. So let's take the value down a little bit and like this is looking a bit nicer to me I think we're getting a bit closer to some of these colors and I think the last tweak I'm gonna make here is shifting the sky color a bit more orange because I don't really actually like the red that much it's getting a bit weird I think this looks a little bit better now all of this is gonna change a ton when we add in atmosphere so let's add in octane fog volume now we're gonna need to scale this up really really big so in order to not crash our computers I'm just gonna max out this voxel size which effectively makes the volume super low resolution, but I'm not actually gonna add any detail to it like clouds. This is just gonna be for the purpose of creating some haze. And if I pull back here, I want this volume to be pretty low hanging. So I think we could just do 500. And then from here, let's add some numbers. And I'll show you what happens if we're only covering this section of the terrain first. So let's make this like, I don't know, about this big where it's covering some of the mountains, but not the entirety of our scene. Let's jump back. Now, sometimes if the box isn't big enough, um, it won't actually show up at all. So I think I need to set this number a bit higher. And there we go. Now we can actually see that we've got a volume. And so that's totally blacked out our screen. The first thing I want to do is hide the volume in our viewport so we can actually see here. And then I'll come into our medium and then jump into the volume medium and take the density way, way down. Now we also want to make sure in our absorption and scattering, we've got these set to white. And so this is already looking a lot more interesting, but the thing that's happening is if you look at the line of mountains here, we can't distinguish one from the next because these all exist outside the volume box. So we need to make that volume box a lot bigger. So let's bring back the visibility on our volume here. And in our generate tab, I'm just going to add some additional numbers let's make this even bigger four by four 
So that's super huge. That's going to get us coverage right there, but I'll scooch this over so it's covering everything. And maybe even make it taller. Cool. Let's jump back into our camera. And now you see that we're going to have to take down the density even further. So let's just say 0 0.05, 0 0.005. Cool. So now you can see we've got this deeper draw distance and all these mountains appear distinct from one another. Let's compare store render buffer. I want to see what this would look like if we did the same thing in our medium tab of our daylight. So I'm just going to add fog here. And this is a bit more of a cheat, but it has its own distinct look that I'd like to see. So I'm going to untick enable AB comparison so we can see what's going on. And then I'll just increase this medium radius until things start to go dark. Then jump into the scattering medium and make sure both of these are white. Cool, and now we need to drop the density. So now if we go to compare enable, you can see we've got a lot more control with the volume object. And you can pair both systems together, like sometimes this can be good for just some general haze on top of your initial haze. Like here we're adding an even more dustiness on top of this fog volume. So that could be a cool look for later. And in order to store that, I can just duplicate this daylight and turn this one off. So this will be the one that has the fog. So we can just name this fog. And then this one, we can just remove the medium here. So we're back to where we started. Okay, the next thing I want to try with this volume is uh, the scattering phase. So let's go compare and store this again. And if I move this upwards, the volume will get much stronger closer to the light. So some of this is definitely good. Though at some point we start losing the distant mountains. So we can compensate by making this even lower and then pushing the phase up higher. Okay, now the phase is too high. Let's bring it back. Now another fun thing to play with is putting colors into the absorption. So say we add in a bit more of a blue in the absorption, you'll see what happens. This is kind of like the diffuse color of the fog and this will be even more apparent if we set the scattering phase back to zero. Now you can see it's really inheriting that color. But really for the distant haze, we want more of this dusty brown, or even this orange could work here, though I feel like this photo is hypersaturated and not exactly the look I want to go for. So let's set this to an orange color, maybe a dark brown. And we could also try going back to our volume and taking the size of this uh, bounding box a lot higher. Okay, and to bring a bit more lightness back to the horizon, let's bring back some of our scattering face, not too much. Let's go a bit further. And let's change this absorption color to more of a bright orange and see what happens. Let's move it even more towards yellow. Okay, I think I've taken it too far. Let's desaturate this a bit. And then finally, if you increase the volume step length, this can change the look a bit, but it'll also really decrease your render times a ton. So now it's rendering way faster. Okay, I'm liking this more, but now the whole image has gone this shade of orange, and there's not enough color variation going on. So what I can do is go to my white point and try to dial against that by pushing some orange in, and that'll get me the color opposite. So that's desaturated things a bit, but then I can compensate by upping the saturation. So actually, I'm finding that if I bring this saturation down to something like 1.3 here, this is getting a lot closer uh, to what I want. And lastly, we can play around with these response curves. And I was finding that this one here adds a lot to the look. And now, if we flip back to our references, you can see that we're actually getting a lot closer to some of these colors. We could still maybe up the exposure a bit and then drop the gamma to bring in a bit more contrast and maybe pull in some vignetting to really create more of a sky gradient here. And then back up a bit with the gamma to compensate. And if we rotate around the daylight, we can see that this can still look interesting from other angles as well. Just don't push it too far because then it starts to reveal all the weird colors we've got going on. And this just goes to show how important the lighting is to creating a compelling image. So let's go back to this backlit look. Okay, now that we've got the look dialed in, I'd like to point out something. If we're a bit higher up, we can see that this texture has tons of repetitions because it's just a tiled texture. And if we wanted to do an aerial shot like this, we'd need to find some way to fix it. So what we can do is we can call this um, medium rocks. 
and I'm going to duplicate this setup and also duplicate the texture itself. And I'm going to replace this texture and call this one small rocks. And then it's just a matter of coming here and I'm going to decrease the size to one by one. Now keep in mind that when we scale the texture down, it's going to get a lot spikier and look more displaced because we haven't actually changed the displacement amount. So we want to jump in and change this to something like 12. And we can even go and offset this texture by some amount. Okay, and now let's make one for large rocks. So we'll duplicate this again, call this large. And then duplicate our texture one last time and replace it. And here we want this to be, let's just do four. And again, with the displacement, now we're going bigger. So with the bigger texture, we actually want to increase the displacement amount. So with this one, we had it at 25. So this one we want to be 50. And we can offset this one differently as well. Now hopefully it's obvious we've got a lot more variation in our surface, but if we come up here, it should become really apparent. So before with just our medium rocks, let's take a look at what that looked like. So the pattern is a lot more obvious here, especially with this rock repeating over and over. But adding back the small and the large rocks, there's enough variation that our eye isn't going to pick that pattern. So let's go back to where we were. Okay, so next I'm going to create the sand. Um, let's just duplicate one of these terrains and hide the others. And this one will remove the texture and create a new material. I'll drop this on here and I'll call this sand. Okay, let's jump into the node editor and give ourselves some space. Okay, I'm going to take an image texture and if you drag directly onto the dot here, it'll automatically connect. Now I'm going to look up and find in my assets library here, I've got under polygon, I've got this sand texture that I highlighted earlier. So I think it's under ground sand. So here are some different options. And the one that I want is this ground sand desert rippled high res. Okay, so in this case, we're going to control everything with a transform node. So let's drag in this transform and let's scale it down. And now let's duplicate this by holding down control, drag in our transform node again, and then this one will replace with our roughness map. And I can find it easily by typing in ground, sand, desert again. So I want this gloss high res. And I'll pull this into the roughness. And the interesting thing with polygon textures is that they use these gloss maps, but gloss maps are actually the inverse of roughness maps. So in this case, we want to invert this. Okay, and we're not actually seeing any glossiness because this is set to diffuse. So let's set the type to glossy and now we're seeing something. Okay, let's duplicate this down again and pop in our specular map. And you can see it's already saved this. So if I just delete this uh, gloss here, I'll find a list of what I want. So here I want the reflection map high res. And I'll pop that into specular. And this one we don't want inverted. So there we go, that's brought down the specularity a lot, which is good. Okay, let's duplicate this again and put our transform in there and let's grab the normal map this time. So I'll just delete this off and come down here to normal high res and put that in there. Cool, and now we've got a sense of how large this texture actually still is because you can see these sand ripples are massive. So let's bring this transform way down. So that's more of the scale that we're looking for. And a good way to change this uh, texture is if you go to the specular channel, if you mess with the gamma, you can make this a lot less shiny or a lot more shiny, depending on what you're after. I think I'll leave it where it was, but just good to know. And just to prove to you the thing about the roughness map, if I untick invert, you can see just how weird this gets. There's just fireflies all over the place and this never fully resolves. Last but not least, let's add in our displacement map. Drag this down, attach our transform again, and then let's search for our displacement. Displacement high res and the source on this is 8K. 
So let's go to our displacement channel, click add displacement, make sure that we're using 8K and then plug this in. And so we're getting these crazy breakup patterns. All we have to do is change from follow geometric normal to follow smooth normal. And now let's disconnect the normal map so that we can kind of see the displacement working by itself. So this needs to be increased. Let's try 50. That's way too much. Let's go back to 20. Okay, I think that should be good enough. Let's add our normal map back in. Now we can see the contribution that the displacement's making. And honestly, I'm not sure if we need displacement in this case. One issue it's creating is if you get pretty close to it, you can see that there's still a lot of artifacting going on. It is creating actual ridges, which is really good, but we might be able to get away with just using the normal map in this case. One last thing we could play with is this rotation on Z here. So if we want the stripes to go a different direction, or if we want them to be coming towards us, this can be really cool. And I'm gonna decrease the scale a little bit more. Okay, so I feel like these grooves are a little bit too intense, so I'm gonna reduce the normal map until that effect is lessened. So I think that's a bit nicer. And I realized one reason the displacement wasn't working too well was I think I selected an 8-bit displacement map rather than the 16-bit. And so that was causing some extra artifacts. So let's go back and select 8K and follow smooth normal. And then let's duplicate this and pull our transform back in. And again, let's locate this displacement map here. And you can see we've got a bunch of different options for displacement map. I think I selected the high res, but I want the 16 bit high res. So let's add that in there. And already this is looking a lot nicer. And I think I actually want to up the scale of this texture. Not quite that large, but somewhere around there might be cool. And then let's bump up this displacement map even higher. Okay, cool. I'm liking that a lot. So let's add our rocks back in. Right, so we're barely seeing any of the rocks and that's because this displacement is set to zero and if we set the mid-level to 0.5, it'll drop down the surface. Okay, cool, so now you can see that there's a pretty big difference between the color of the rocks and the color of the sand. We can kind of get these closer together by altering the color of the sand. So let's come up here and let's add in a color correction node. And let's try taking the saturation down a bit and maybe moving the hue a bit more orange. And I also think the sand looks a bit better if we drop the gamma so it gets a bit brighter. Okay, so now let's see if we can blend these rocks into the sand better as if they were covered in dust. Um, if we look here at some of these rocks, this is an actual photo of Mars, and you can see that the dust really covers up the rock surface. So let's see if we can do something along those lines. And credit to this idea goes to Andrew Price, who also did uh, a Mars tutorial in Blender and went to pretty great lengths to get these to blend. We're gonna do something a bit more simple than what he did. So let's go to the large rocks first as our demo because they're the easiest to see. And let's just disconnect this diffuse for the time being. And we'll pull in a couple RGB spectrums and a mix node. And then let's also pull in a fall off node. This is pretty similar to a technique in the advanced shaders tutorial where I created some dust. So here, let's pop this in the diffuse and let's put these two RGB spectrums in here. The first one will just make bright red, and the second one will make bright green. So these will stand out a ton as color opposites. And then we'll plug the fall off map in here to the amount. Now we wanna select normal versus vector 90 degrees, and this should work as a slope where vertical faces get one color and horizontal faces get another color. So let's pull down the skew factor and you can see what's beginning to happen. We're getting green on some surfaces and red on others, so that's good. So we want this original texture to be on the red. So let's find where our red is and replace it. And now maybe we want a little more of the original texture to come through, like this might be a bit too extreme. So let's go back to our fall off map and increase this even further. Now you can see we're getting our original texture coming through, but green on all of these surfaces that are close to the ground. So that's perfect. Now we just have to shift this green color to something that matches more closely to the environment. So let's grab our green here and we could even color pick. And maybe let's go a bit brighter. So let's store a render buffer and see what happens if we bypass this whole thing. So that's kind of a before and after. 
So now you can see this dust coming in here. I think we could brighten it up a bit and maybe desaturate it. So interestingly, the closer we get to white, the more these dark shadows disappear. Um, and it starts to blend in with the sand a lot nicer. And now let's see if we can't finesse it a bit more by increasing this skew factor just a touch. Cool, so that's helping a lot. Let's get rid of this red color here. And we can take this whole chain here and copy it. And then go to our other rock textures and paste and just replace what's in the diffuse currently and get rid of the old stuff same thing for the small rocks cool so now we should be able to see how extra dusty this is all looking I feel like a lot of this is too shiny so I'm just gonna swing the octane daylight around And now it's feeling like a much dustier Mars. Okay, so I'm really not feeling these sand ripples enough. So I'm going to go back to our rippled texture and just double the displacement here to 44. I'm finding this a lot more interesting looking. The next thing that bugs me about this picture, other than the mountains, obviously, which we'll get to texturing at some point, is that it's too uniform. If we look at our references here, you can see that there are big patches of sand as well as other regions where there are a lot more rocks. So let's try to mimic that in our render. So let's just take this sand and add a displacement deformer. So hold down shift and it'll become a child of that as we select it. Now here under shading, I just wanna drop in a noise. So this is kind of meta because I'm adding this displacer to the terrain that we already created with a bunch of displacers and then baked down. But what this will do for us if we increase the height you can see that we're bubbling out the terrain in certain regions. Now, this is way too high frequency. We want to go in and make the noise a lot bigger. So now we'll have patches where there are just sand and patches where there are just rocks. And I think this is a bit too high. I was just pushing this up to show you what was going on, but let's bring this down to something like 10. So they're pretty close, but there are regions that are slightly higher with the sand and regions that are slightly higher with the rocks. And now it should be pretty clear that there are clusters of sand and clusters of rocks. Now we can actually do this again by just copying our displacer and let's jump into the shading and change the noise seed. And let's add another digit here so that it gets a lot bigger. So this is our super big noise. We'll just call this super big noise and we'll call this one big noise. And now we've got regions where there's just sand and regions where there's just rock clusters. And if we come up here, this is a much more interesting look to the terrain than what we had earlier. So maybe we went too big on the super big noise. Let's cut this in half to maybe 5,000. Let's try 7,000. Cool, I think that looks pretty sweet, but the convenient thing is you can just change this seed and basically see it reflected here in your viewport. Like here we know we're gonna get some sand close to the camera. I think that's pretty nice seeing this sand texture here. And we can quickly make this more interesting by just pushing close to the ground and then going into our camera imager and bringing up the aperture a little bit. And now we want to turn off autofocus. And we're going to run into an issue when we try to pick focus here. Because we've got this volume on, it's seeing this volume object as what it's picking focus to, so it's gonna be super close to the lens. So let's turn this off for a second, and then let's pick focus again. And obviously things are looking weird because there's no volume object. So let's turn it back on. Cool, so that's better. And now let's bring up our aperture, and let's kind of get a bit closer to some of these rocks. And let's set our aperture aspect ratio to two, and our edge to three to get that anamorphic bokeh look. And let's bring down our aperture so it's not so shallow in the foreground. Cool, so I think this makes the composition look a lot more interesting because we've got this foreground, like we're staring over the edge of this big dune down into this valley. Okay, the last thing I wanna fix with this ground texture is that I don't like that in certain patches, like with the rocks, it's a bit more desaturated than the sand. And also, if we look at our reference here, the sand is a bit more orange in most of these. Like this one, it's a bit more desaturated, so we could kind of go for this, but I wanna add in a bit more orange to the sand. So let's go to our rippled sand here, and let's just go to our saturation and boost it some. So that's too far, but we can also bring down the brightness 
a bit and play with the hue. So that's too red. So these are really subtle tweaks here. But maybe that and then a little less saturated. So I'm liking this a bit better, but now we've emphasized that difference between the sand and the rocks even more. So let's um, create a copy of this camera and jump into it. And this one will just take away the shallow depth of field, take the aperture all the way down. So we can back up a bit and see the difference that these changes are making. Over here somewhere might be a good litmus test for where the rocks are meeting the sand. And also here with this displacement, we're never going to get this close to the sand, so it doesn't really matter. But we might be able to fix this with some filtering on the displacement. So if we choose Gaussian and set it to something like 2, you can see it's basically just blurring the displacement map. But I'm going to keep this off for now because I feel like it's kind of processor intensive. And let's go back to our large rocks into this fall off map and color. So let's change this color to try and get closer to this orange. So obviously that's way too far. But now we're getting somewhere still too saturated. That feels maybe more appropriate, though we could also shift it a little more yellow. And that's definitely getting a lot better. Now we could also play with the fall off map. The further we crank this to the left, the more the dust overtakes the rocks. You can see if we go too far, then they just become a solid color. So maybe somewhere around here. Cool, I think I'm happy with that. Let's just copy all of these nodes again and paste them to our other two rock textures. And we can right click here, select hierarchy and then delete. And paste again. select hierarchy, delete, and this one and this one are two rogue nodes. We can also select hierarchy and just scooch this upwards. Okay, so I saved out two frames and comparing these two, you can see that the changes we've made really blend the sand into the rocks a bit better. A final note is keep in mind we can always dial back on this LUT, so here's without it. So that's making a pretty dramatic difference. But if it gets too saturated in orange, we could just cut this to about 0.8, and then we'll have a bit less of an orange oversaturated look. Okay, so now let's start bringing in a couple of those scanned rocks. I'm just going to go to File, Merge, and in my rocks, I've got these three volcanic rocks, as well as a couple cliffs and some sandstone. I'll start with uh, one of these volcanic rocks here. So I'm actually going to go with the high quality versus these LOD 0 through 5 rocks, which have lower poly counts, but can make up the detail with normal and displacement maps. But I'm just going to bring in the high quality here. Cool. And now let's go to our materials here and go to convert materials and then remove unused materials. Then let's go to our node editor. All right, let's pull this image texture into the diffuse. And now we want to make sure we're in the image folder for QIVWJ. Let's go back here. Here we go. Let's pull in the albedo. It's the same as diffuse. And then we'll copy this over and pull in the roughness. So there's just a roughness right there. And this somehow got swapped around just now. So let's put that there and that there and duplicate this again and we'll grab the bump and if we store a render buffer we can see what difference the bumps gonna make so it's just adding in a bit of detail there and then we can also bring in the normal bump which is just a normal map there are also these other normal maps depending on which level of detail you've selected but we just want this normal bump here and if we store that and remove it this side is with, this side's without, so we're adding a bit more detail in there. So let's pull that normal back in. And we also forgot to select glossy texture. So here we also want the specular map. So I'll just duplicate this up and pull in our specular right here. And now we should be good to go. So we'll just copy this whole model over 
and I'll bring it up close to the camera and let's kind of roughly position it over here okay now so obviously it's way too dark let's pull in a, a color correction node and let's start with gamma so that gets us most of the way there we could probably shift this slightly away from orange and we could also desaturate it and I think I'm actually gonna move it out into the field here pretty far and scale it down I actually think the orange looked a bit better blends in a bit more and we'll duplicate this up and move it somewhere over here and maybe move this one even further back maybe we'll move this up here to the edge of this mound to create some more interesting shapes along this ridge I think that's adding a little something okay so I've just gone and done that same texturing process with this other mega scans asset and it's looking pretty good but the bump is causing some issues so I'll compare store this and take out the bump the bump is causing all these weird extra details that I think are unnecessary in this case if we store again and remove the normal this is what it's looking like without the normal but I think the added detail from the normal map is fine so I'll leave that in there so I'm just gonna copy this rock over cool so I'll just position this first before I fire off another render and I think it's a bit too big so I've scaled it on down a bit and then we'll just kind of bring it over and find an interesting place for it to rest I'm thinking it might look better a little further into the background let's try something like that for starters okay so same deal let's boost the gamma and drop the power and then let's put a color correction node in there shift the hue a bit a little bit brighter still and then let's desaturate just kidding on the brightness I think that's getting pretty close to where it's not standing out too too much but I think we can find a better position for it maybe this is one that would look good close to the camera but scaled down this is starting to look interesting that we're catching the inside of it so let's tip it upwards like that and then to the side So I finally found a good home for it over here where it's kind of jutting out of the sand. Uh, and I think that's a pretty cool look. So I might do that in a couple other spots. It can also be really important with these super high poly models to create instances. Like this sandstone rock I'm working with is close to 2 million polys. So for this kind of thing, if you duplicate it a bunch, it's going to eat through your VRAM really fast. So let's go up to this menu here and drop down to instance and that just automatically created an instance of this. Now if we delete the original, it'll get unlinked, but that's okay because we can just relink it to the same model. We only need one copy of the original model and the rest can be instances. Now if you look closely, this is still eating through my VRAM. It's almost up to 5 gigs, but the thing I haven't done yet is selected all of these and ticked render instance and so now I'm down to 3.8 gigs and the scene is way lighter alright let's move on to texturing these mountains finally so I'm gonna jump into a new camera and scooch on over to one of these mountains here and I'll create a new glossy material and find this landscape and drop it on come to my node editor punch in an image texture for the diffuse and I'm gonna navigate to this textures.com 3d scans and there's one in here that I really like the look of it's this kind of layered rock 
So I'll drop in the diffuse there. And let's UV transform and rotate this so it's horizontal. And I think it would be easier to see if we turned off the volume. And I'm going to also turn off these other rocks and terrain so things will move a lot faster. Okay, let's just rotate this around. Now I can actually see it rotating live and we can scale this down a whole bunch. Now the bulk of the work is going to get done by the displacement, so let's just duplicate this up, pop this into the transform, and grab our displacement here. We also need to click add displacement. Follow smooth normal and 8K. And now let's really boost this displacement height. There we go. So that's looking a lot more interesting. It's still too big. And that's repeating too much. So let's split the difference. So I'm happy enough with that. I think it needs to blend in more with this color. So let's boost the gamma. and pop in a color correction node. Let's boost the saturation and let's play with the gamma some more. We could also up the contrast, decrease the saturation. Let's see what it looks with the volume back on. That looks pretty good to me. I think it's a bit dark compared to this. So let's boost it a bit more. That's looking pretty good to me. Now let's just duplicate that over to the other landscapes. So we've got an issue where the texture's running vertically on some of these. So let's just duplicate our camera again and move over there to see what the deal is. So for this, we're gonna need to create a duplicate texture and replace it and jump into the node editor and then rotate this. If we ditch the displacement temporarily, we can see it rotate in real time. That's looking pretty good to me. And maybe we want more displacement. That's more like it. I think we want that same change on the other material too. Now the other thing that's obvious is we want a lot more roughness here because we're getting all these little fireflies. So let's go into the roughness and crank that up. And now let's just reduce the specular down. And let's really crank the roughness all the way so that it doesn't look so shiny. Same thing goes for this other material. Roughness all the way up. Specular all the way down at 0.15. Okay, let's see how this is looking now and let's turn our rocks back on. Let's create another copy of this landscape and then put our large rock texture on it. And let's jump back over here to see what that looks like. Okay, we're gonna have to duplicate this large rock texture because we're not seeing anything and replace it. And then go into the displacement here and change the mid-level down to zero. And then for the original texture here, let's change the mid-level on this displacement to 1. So that this one displaces less and the rocks displace more. Because right now the cliff face is overriding the rocks and not letting them come through. Okay, now we can see what the issue is. When I put this large rock texture here, I forgot to put 4x4 four four for the scale. That's more like it, but I think we could actually go up to something like 10x10 10 10 and then increase the displacement on this one. So let's go in here and up the displacement to something like 200. And that's looking pretty cool by itself, but let's see if we can mix the two textures together. So we'll call this landscape big rocks. And we'll call this landscape striations. Now let's jump back into our texture and in the displacement, let's set this to 0.5. So we'll just bring this up gradually until it intersects with this rock texture. 
go back to zero and see what happens. Okay, so zero is too far. Let's try point three. Though you can see some of these rocks are poking through. Let's go to point two, point one. And I'd also like to get rid of some of this color variation, which doesn't seem consistent with this other terrain. So if I just desaturate, that's not exactly gonna help. But what I can do is mix in a color. So let's put a mix down. Make sure this is texture two. And then let's grab an RGB spectrum and color pick the ground. And so you can see that's looking a lot more consistent. I think the color needs to be a bit brighter and less orange. And actually a bit darker from that. It's looking pretty close. And we can also just borrow our big noise from our sand and see what happens if we put it in there. And the big noise doesn't look like it's gonna be big enough, so let's get rid of that and put the super big noise in there. That's more what I'm looking for. And let's boost the height to 50. Cool, so now we're seeing more variations in there. Let's see what it looks like from a distance. Okay, so all these other landscapes were pretty okay as far as the orientation of that main texture. So I can probably just make these editable and right click and say connect objects and delete. So we've just got one object that represents all the rest of these landscapes. And that helps because now we can just duplicate this single landscape and swap out the big rock texture here. And also put in the super big noise. Okay, so we don't get confused. Let's call this majority landscapes striations. And we'll call this majority landscape big rocks. So in our landscape striations, we need to fix this other texture because right now the displacement mid-level is set to zero. So if we hop over to this camera, we should be able to see that we're only seeing these striations so we want to set this to 0.1 like we did with the other texture. And now we're starting to see some of these rocks peek through, but maybe we'll take this one even further and go to 0.2. So I think this is helping the mountains blend into the ground here because it's adding in that dirt that we've put everywhere else. And maybe it wouldn't hurt to do something similar here. So we'll go back to this landscape, which is our regular old landscape striations here. And we'll jump in, make sure we hit get active materials so we're only seeing one material. There we go. And this displacement, let's set it to 0.2. Cool. And I like that change because the profile of this mountain here, we're seeing a lot more of these little bumps and rocks poking through, which really takes away the CG feel. And if we look at the reference from the Martian, you can see the profile on this cliff is what really sells the scale. And this kind of thing you only get through painstaking work, like maybe sculpting it out in ZBrush, or it could just as easily be something that was composited in from actual photo reference of cliffs. Okay, let's bring back our other rocks so we can check out our progress. And let's re-up the shallow depth of field here. And I'm liking this a bit better panned upwards, which should give room for some nice buildings uh, and profiles against this sky. So this is looking really cool, but just watch out because I have already almost hit six gigs of RAM. So you might want to constrain your scene and not put so many high poly models and stuff like that in there and limit the number of displacement instances you're using. Like with those mountains, maybe just use the striations or the dirty rock texture, but not both because we're quickly busting through the limit for 980 Ti's, which is six gigs. I'm on 1080 Ti's for this tutorial, so I'm good to go for a little bit longer, but this scene is getting super heavy. One thing you can do to optimize is any texture that's black and white, set the format to float, and it'll use up less VRAM. So I'm gonna go through and see how much VRAM I can save myself by setting all the textures that only need to be black and white to float. So that saved close to half a gig of VRAM, not the best ever, but pretty good. 
Okay, so if you're on a budget, I want to show you how you can make some displacement maps without having to go out and buy them. This is a tip from Stuart Lippincott, aka Stuzor. Many of you may know the great Stuzor. So let's just drop in a plane here and we'll just add a standard C4D material. We'll drop it on. We'll jump in and we're going to set this to luminance mode. And then in the luminance texture, we'll create a noise. And this is where you can get super creative again by putting this into a layer shader if you want. So if you remember, we did this last time for the general shape to the terrain, but this time we're trying to create those micro displacements. And one reason we didn't create those micro displacements in the displacer is the poly count would get out of control and it would bog our scene way down. Whereas Octane can handle this image based displacement really easily. The only issue is it can't easily convert from Cinema 4D system into displacement on the fly. So we have to bake it out. So let's just go into our layer shader. Let's change this one to something like Stuple. And then up here we can copy this and paste it. And this one will do Luca. And here we want the octaves to be the full 20 and we can scale this up. And this one too, we wanna make sure it's 20 and we'll scale this up as well. So if we right click and go to Cinema 4D Tags Bake Texture, we can come down here and choose the width and height. So in a normal octane displacement map, the max is 8192 by 8192. But if we do that exact resolution, we'll get an issue around the borders where there are some glitches. So we actually want to expand it a little bit. So let's set this to 8196 by 8196. And I'm just going to use a PNG at 16 bits per channel. And I'll set this to this folder where I've been baking out other noise types. And I'll call this combo noise 01. And here we want to set the mode to luminance and we can see a preview. So right now we're only getting the one on top. So if you remember, we can go back here and mix the two of these together. So let's try overlaying these. And maybe the top copy, we actually make the smaller noise and the bottom one is a larger noise so that we've got a variation in detail where some are small details and others are super large. Okay, let's head back to our big texture tag and under options we can hit preview again and we'll get an update as to what the texture will look like and then let's just hit bake. Cool, so now that's done we can just create a diffuse material. So let's come over here and click on add displacement then drop this image texture in here and we'll go and grab our combo noise and now let's drag this onto our plane remove this bake texture tag and then let's fire this off and now let's drop in our daylight and rotate it around and our displacement needs to be at 8k and actually we're still getting this issue around the texture border so the easiest way to fix this is by hitting uv transform here and just scaling it up by the tiniest bit and then that goes away. So here's our combined texture and it's super detailed and you can basically bring in several more of these and layer them up like we've been doing. So say we had another plane and I bring in, I duplicate our material here and I bring in yet another displacement map like this Ober. Now I can push this one up through and maybe increase the displacement height on this and change the mid-level so it goes back down. At a mid-level of 0.5, if I solo this, turn off the other one, this will cause it to stretch from the center, whereas at a mid-level of 0, it'll push upwards. At a mid-level of 1, it'll push downwards. So 0.5 is a pretty good starting place. So this one's kind of cool by itself, but then when we add in the additional texture, we get more variation. And again, if we were to combine this technique with what we learned previously, where we put a displacer that has large-scale displacements as a child of the plane, then add in a noise, and make sure we've got enough segments here, and then scale up the noise, and boost the height, and actually that's too much on the scale, and now the height is crazy. So something like that. And then bring in one of these textures. Here we need to change the displacement to follow smooth normal. And maybe reduce the amount of displacement. Let's try the other texture here. 
same thing. We're going to need to change this to smooth. You can see how these techniques can work in combination, where you're controlling the large scale displacements with a displacer and the small scale ones with a texture. And now if we want, we can put a dirt node in the diffuse, change everything to glossy. add in a gradient and change some colors around. And then take the roughness up or use an actual rock texture for the diffuse like this. But this should give you an idea that you can still make some pretty cool looking stuff without having to go out and spend a ton of money. All right, I wanted to talk about one last way you can make these Martian landscapes or beef up your terrains, and that's with World Creator or World Machine. Uh, I've used both of them. World Machine, I think, is a little more well-known and has really powerful erosion features. And on the whole, I think it's a bit more deep than World Creator, but World Creator is really cool and super user-friendly. And because it's so intuitive, you can basically jump into it without knowing almost anything about the software. So let me just give you a quick demo. Cool, so here I am inside World Creator and Alt and right click will allow you to rotate around. Middle click will let you dolly around. And then I think right click will let you pan. I'm extremely new at this program, but it's super easy to figure out. So let me show you what I'm talking about. First off, let's just go to this terrain here, and we want to make sure we're exporting 8K maps, so we can just come down here to 1 4th meter, and now our resolution will be 8K. And the cool thing about this program is it runs on the GPU, whereas World Machine runs on the CPU, so you can see all your changes in real time, and you can export maps crazy fast, uh, at least 10, if not 100 times faster than World Machine, because it runs on the GPU. So filters is where you're going to do most of your work, and I'm going to add a layer. And I'm not even going to bother naming this because I'm just going to create a single layer and do everything in that one layer and just get in and get out because I really don't know what I'm doing yet with this software. So let's add a canyon. Let's do sand covered canyon and hit OK. So already that's looking kind of cool. We can control the general strength and sharpness here. So maybe we want it a little less sharp and spiky. Something like that. Now let's add another filter and erode it to some extent. So let's try, there are these different types of erosion, but let's just do soft. And now we've got some of these cool lines here that add detail. Maybe it's not that realistic because there's not water on Mars to erode this kind of stuff, but whatever. If we up the sharpness strength here, something kind of cool starts to happen and it feels more like a rocky terrain. Let's try adding maybe some rocky plateaus and just taking down the strength. So just a little bit of that. And then maybe we want the erosion to happen after that. So we can just scooch that over. Next, to make this a lot more canyon-like, let's add some terracing. So let's just go for standard terraces. Now here, if we don't want this to affect the base down here, but only the cliffs, let's just select a height and bring this up. So there we go. And we can also bring up the height smoothness to kind of feather this in even more. Next, I'll take down the general strength. So it's a little bit more subtle there. And we can up the randomness. And I'll push this after the rocky plateaus, but before the erosion. And next, I actually want to add a second terrace. And I'm going to use this as the smaller terracing. So here, we can just take down the strength again and do the same thing to the height so that it's only affecting these cliffs up here. Now we can take the min size down and the max size down pretty far too. And I'll come in here to show you what this is doing. Let's bring the strength back up. You can see this is adding a lot more terracing and they're much smaller. So maybe let's take the max size way down to like three. And then we'll take the strength down so it's more subtle. I'm just trying to create these striations in the landscape. And I'll bring up the height smoothness again. So from a distance, this could be pretty convincing. The last thing I want to do is add in one more type of erosion. And this one's called wind. And if I increase the length here, you can see that this just kind of streaks everything out. But if we select an angle, then we can choose a direction for this wind to come from. So it's almost like sandblasting one part of the terrain, which is kind of a cool variation. So let's bring down the length until this is a lot more subtle. And now we can control the angle width and smoothness. 
and also the direction. So that's kind of an interesting look there, like the cliffs have been eaten away by this wind blasting. And this swirl is pretty fun, though probably not going to use it, but just throwing that out there because that's kind of cool. But the last thing I want to do is probably add in a bit of sediment. So I'm going to go for sediment complex. And it is more processor intensive than any of the other effects that I've found. But for this Mars landscape that's covered in dust and sand, it kind of makes sense to have this in there. If we go back to our base here, we could increase the overall strength by upping this level one. These are kind of like levels of detail where we're working from big to small. So for these cliffs that are probably going to be in the distance, it makes sense to increase their displacement height because I'm going to want them to poke up above the other mountains. Now there's one more thing here. If I go to add under general, there's something called zero edge. And this is going to do exactly what it sounds like and make sure that the edge of the terrain is flattened. And this way, if I bring this in as a separate displacement map, I can kind of poke it up through other terrain without worry that it's going to bubble upwards and create an issue where we're seeing underneath it and stuff like that. And if we want to see other options, we can always change the seed under the base. This is kind of a cool shape here, though it gets a little extreme and spiky. So maybe we can bring that down. And I think I like that. That could be good. Now if we go to export, I'm going to use TIFF 32-bit float because when I used PNG 16-bit, I got all sorts of terrible artifacts and lines in my displacement map in Octane. So hit export. I'm going to call this Mars Canyon 002. And you can see just how fast this is exporting an 8K displacement map. If you've used World Machine at all, you'll know that it can take up to an hour to export an 8K map. So while World Machine might be a little bit more powerful, this program will save you in terms of how quickly you can get things out the door. And just for good measure, I'm going to export one that is a little bit less extreme. I might like this better. But it's literally that easy. Now back in Octane, I'm just going to go and create my displacement map and create my displacement node and drop in our map that we just created. Let's try this Canyon 003 and let's change our output to 8K and bump up our height. And now we're getting a pretty cool looking terrain. I don't love how spiky it is in certain parts, so I'm gonna take it down a little bit. So it would probably be something closer to this. And if we wanna check the other map, it looks like this. This one might be cool to try out. Let's take it into our other scene. Okay, so I've pasted in the plane and scaled it way up, though now we want to push it way back into the background. I'm only going to use this as one of these background mountains. Now keep in mind that if we scale something up a ton, we're going to need to increase its displacement height a lot too. So let's send this off to see what's going on. Okay, so now obviously we need to boost the height a ton, so let's add in a couple ones there. And that's still not enough, so let's boost it even higher. There we go, now if we return to our previous position here. Let's actually bring it a bit closer. And now we'll take the displacement height down by a lot. And now let's scooch it over here. And increase the height again. And drop it on down maybe rotate it. Okay, that's too close, but you can see how this could create some pretty interesting details in your image. I'm going to scoot it back again. Okay, I'm happy with that positioning, but I'm going to decrease this yet again. Let's try 6,000. And now let's push it back upwards a little bit. Okay, 6,000 was too much. Let's try 7,500. Okay, I'm going to add in this other one as well. Okay, and I've added in the second terrain back here as well. Maybe I'll scale this one up a bit and then bring it back to the old 9,000. That's kind of nice over here, though now it's getting in the way. So I'll rotate it around. Okay, this is a more interesting profile for sure, but I think it can be moved back this way. Okay, I think I'm finally happy with this profile over here and this one over here. Now we just need to change the color a bit so it matches this sand texture better. This one, though, is so far in the background that it doesn't even matter. Okay, so what I think I can do is I can just steal the diffuse color and texture from our large rocks here. So I'll just copy all of this and go over to, this is our plane here. We'll call this Close Canyon. And we'll call this Far Canyon. 
So in this texture here, I'll click get active material to just see that one. I'll paste and I'll scooch this over. But let's store our render buffer so we can see the difference and plug this into the diffuse. And you can see that's pretty much solved it. Okay, the last thing is this texture is currently set to diffuse. So I'm going to compare store render buffer and let's see if we can get it looking good with glossy so that we can maybe catch some highlights on that canyon. Now we're going to want to take up the roughness because the specular is currently too tight to even see it. But hopefully you can see this gives it just a bit more visual interest like some of these rocks are catching the highlights on the side of the canyon. So there's the before and after. It's pretty subtle, but I think it's an improvement. Okay, I promise this is going to be the very last thing that I show before moving on to the actual space colony part of this thing and getting into assembling the kit bash buildings. So I'm going to duplicate our camera and kind of pull back on this one. And for this, I'm going to make more of a vertical composition. So more Instagram style. So let's bring this over here and give ourselves some room. And then I'll set this dimension to 1080 by 1350, which is the tall Instagram format. Cool. So on this one, we're going to bring in a couple more planes just for close to the camera. And so that I can get this done a bit faster, I'm just going to shut all of these off for the time being, as well as some of these other landscape objects. Cool. So this makes it a lot quicker to navigate. So let's take this plane and just dump it below our camera and reset PSR. So it's in the exact same coordinate as our camera. And now let's just move it down a little bit and out this away. So that's an easy way to get this plane in the same position as our camera. And I'm going to rotate it 90 degrees here and scooch it over. So the composition is going to be something like this, where we're looking out of a couple canyon walls. Uh, and I'll actually stretch this upwards so that we cover the entirety of that vertical height. And same thing goes with this one. Cool, and we want to make sure these are actually out of the camera's hierarchy so that we can back up and find a composition here. So we're going to find the texture for our striations here, and we're just going to drop that onto this plane. And let's call this left wall, and this one right wall. And let's bring this one forward. And in this case, the texture is repeating way too much, so let's just scale it up. Let's try 300 by 300. And obviously we're going to have to alter this, and it's I think it's facing the wrong orientation, so let's just duplicate this texture here so we can actually alter it properly. Let's jump back in here. Let's take down the displacement. And this transform, let's go to 90. It would be easier to see the orientation if we remove the displacement, so let's try that. Okay, that's looking right. Now let's add the displacement back in and take it further down. Let's go 40. And I think what's happening is we're seeing the wrong side of this displacement. So let's flip this wall 180 degrees. That's more like it. Okay, now here we could probably boost this up to 0 0.2. And if we turn this away, we can kind of see what the texture is looking like. So maybe let's just stretch this plane out a lot more. So that helps a lot. And now let's increase the displacement, say 60. Let's see how far we can push it. Point 0.5 helps. I think that's a bit too much. Let's take it down to 75. OK, and let's just copy this over for the right wall. Now the right wall, we're also going to have to stretch. Let's scooch this back. And let's stretch it out to a similar aspect as the other one. This is kind of cool how shadowy this is getting. Now there's a little bit of weirdness here with this sticking out, so maybe we can scale this up slightly. That fixed it. And then let's drag this upwards so that we're not seeing the top get cropped off there. Same thing goes with this one. Now one last thing we can do to make this a lot cooler is that same trick with the displacer. Uh, in this case, I think I want to try a new kind of noise type. I'll go to my shading here and add in a noise. And I'll increase the height so we can see that it's working. 
and here I want to try Hama. Now let's increase the scale a lot. And also we need our plane to have way more segments. Like let's go 500 by 500. We're going to have to increase the scale even further. So let's try this, maybe half that, something like that. So even though there are these kind of sharp lines here, we're not really seeing them because that's covered up with the displacement. So we can just change our seed until it looks like something cooler. And then let's reduce the displacement height. I think that's pretty nice right there. So let's just copy the same displacer over and make sure we have enough segments here. And on this one, again, let's just mess with the seed. It's kind of difficult to see what's going on here, so we can hit NF, and then we'll see a bit of a better view. Now here, I think we need a bit more displacement. Let's keep trying a different seed. That looks cooler. So if you're seeing these weird artifacts on the right side, it's because light is actually bleeding through the cracks of this wall because the displacement is tearing things a bit too much. So what we can do is we can actually put this one into a cloth surface. So let's go up to simulate cloth, cloth surface, hold down alt so that it becomes the parent. And then we don't need any subdivisions extra. We just want a bit of thickness and let's increase the thickness even more. And now we're no longer seeing those artifacts. So if we bring all the rest of the stuff back in, let's check out what we've got. And actually this is displaced way too much. So let's take this displacer height back down. And that works for me, but maybe I'm going to change this noise seed one more time. Cool. That's pretty interesting. Maybe we'll see what this composition looks like if we go a bit higher and maybe come forward until we can catch a bit more of those rock formations out there and maybe pivot downwards a bit and we could also widen the camera lens and when I decrease these to something like 200 I'm finding I'm getting more interesting results see now we've got more vertical repetitions and I think this is a bit cooler looking maybe the displacement height is a bit too much now let's go down to 50 Let's go to 65, and I'll change the seed again on this displacer on the left. And don't forget that just by duplicating your daylight and changing the north offset, we can get some pretty dramatically different looks. So I think this sun position is pretty cool, so I'll save that one. Duplicate again. This one's pretty interesting too. And this is pretty interesting too in that it goes to show how well we've matched all these pieces together that we can blast the sun in here at a higher position and all these textures still look like they belong together for the most part. They're not perfect, but they're pretty close. And by bringing the sun way down in the sky and decreasing its power, we can make it feel like a nighttime scene. I had also increased the turbidity, which makes the contrast ratio a lot lower, kind of diffuses the light a lot more. Okay, but I'm going to go back to our original sun's position and then call this canyon cam, and I'll call this main cam. And for this one, we just need to turn back off the canyon walls and set our resolution back to 1920 by 1080. And then I'll dock this back down here. Okay guys, congrats for getting through that entire environment creation process. I know this was the longest tutorial to date, but hopefully it just goes to show all the crazy detail that you can put into your environments, as well as all the different techniques you can employ. Now don't forget there's that Kitbash 3D promo code, Bash, and that should get you that sweet 15% discount. I love playing around in those cities because once I've got one established, I can just fly the camera around, play around with lighting and texturing and composition. And imagine trying to do that with TurboSquid assets where you're buying each building individually. It would just cost a mini fortune. So I'll see you guys next week and I hope you enjoy. And next week is Kitbash 3D and more buildings and all that craziness. So I'll catch you next time. Bye.